Borders and Immigration. That's actually the title of my sermon. And um, because there's been a lot of thought about that. You have people all over the place um, saying different things. Some totally going for all sorts of statism on the planet in order to uphold, you know, borders and immigration and others like going totally the other way. Well, there shouldn't be any borders or they should be open borders or shouldn't be any immigration process. So anyways, I want to address from God's word um, what he's revealed regarding these matters. And I hope it's a blessing to you. So why don't we stand up, we'll have a word of prayer, and then I'll begin my sermon. Father, we do rejoice in you, and we thank you that you do speak to all matters of life, including the matters of borders, nations, immigration. And Lord, we just ask and pray that you use what's preached here today for good um, as we look at your word in this regard. Father, I ask and pray that we would understand your ways and your thoughts better, and that you would take what is preached here to use it to build further in people's lives a biblical worldview and your understanding, your economy regarding matters in the earth. And I ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You could be seated. There are those advocating today, even amongst Christians, that there should be no borders or there should be open borders or that there should be no immigration process. That people should just be allowed to enter and leave nations at their convenience without any hindrance by government officials. Now, when I first heard Christians advocating this, it struck in my craw as not right. Why? Because it's nothing but leftist dogma and tripe, much of what I read and heard. Some Christians will actually say it's not leftist teaching, but I know better as I was raised amongst leftists over in the city of Detroit. So you can sell that nonsense to the lily white boys raised in the suburbs, but it doesn't work with me. I was raised amongst the leftists. The truth is, the issue is being sloganized as stupidly as the marriage issue is being sloganized by some Christians. You know, now that the state has decreed that sodomites can marry, there are Christians that say, quote, the state should just get out of the marrying business altogether, unquote. Heard that slogan? The truth is, the state has always been involved with marriage, always will be involved with marriage, if you doubt that. Uh, Just look at the Obergefell opinion by the Supreme Court. And the truth is, the state should be involved with marriage. The magistrates have the duty to uphold the law, word, and created order of God regarding marriage. They do not have the right to license marriage. And that's why I refuse to marry people with a marriage license, because it's beyond their jurisdiction passes their limitations. But they do have the right and duty to make law to see that marriage as defined by God's law, word, and created order is upheld and not perverted by men. as the duty of the magistrates. And so it is when it comes to this matter of borders and immigration. We have seen a sloganeering take place to justify more leftist or libertarian thought. I'm not going to go into those slogans if you haven't heard them, but there's numerous ones, and I can um, I could address several right off the top of my head. Understand, not all leftists or libertarians embrace no border or open border or no immigration process ideology, but it prevails among them. So don't allow the straw man argument of someone proffering a leftist or libertarian who speaks against such things. All right? Because there's those leftists and libertarians who do speak against the idea of no borders, open borders, no immigration process. Here's the truth. God establishes borders. He raises up nations and he brings nations down. He blesses nations and he judges nations. He established Israel's borders. When you cross into another nation's borders, you come under their jurisdiction. You come under their law. 
And in God's economy, both the citizen and the alien, the stranger, come under the same body of law. And yes, there was a process of immigration into the nation of Israel. My first assertion is that God himself is the author and originator of nations and borders. The scriptures are see, spot, run, clear on that. God is the author and originator of nations and borders. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17, the book of Acts chapter 17, and we'll look at verse 26. This is Paul preaching, and he says, And he, talking about God, has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and then look what it says, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. He raises up nations, he brings them down, he establishes their borders where they dwell. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 10, back in the Old Testament. Book of Genesis, chapter 10. Look what it says in verse 5. It says, From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. Verse 20 says, These were the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, and in their nations. Verse 31, these were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages and their lands, according to their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations. And from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. Again, my assertion is simple. God is the author and originator of nations and borders. And the Bible is completely clear on that matter. He raises up nations. He takes nations down. He blesses nations. He judges nations. And God sets the borders of nations. And he even set the borders for Israel, his people, that nation itself. He gave borders to that nation. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 34. The book of Numbers... And we're in chapter 34, and I'm not going to read it all, but mark it down for your notes, verses 1 through 12. Numbers chapter 34, verses 1 through 12. Verse 3 describes the southern border. Verse 6 describes the western border. Verse 7 describes the northern border. And verse 10 describes the eastern border in quite a bit of detail. So there's nothing wrong with borders. There's nothing wrong with nations. God is the original author of nations and borders. And that's my first assertion. My second assertion is that when you cross the border into another nation, you come under their jurisdiction, you come under their law. And again, the Lord himself established this for his people Israel. Law for all whether for the natural-born or the foreign-born. Look at Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, verse 49. Exodus 12, verse 49. Leviticus 24, 22. We'll be looking at some of these later. Leviticus 24, 22. Numbers 15, 29. Numbers 15, 29. And Numbers 15, 16. Numbers 15, 16 all say that there is one law for both the natural born in Israel and the stranger, the foreign born. So if you murder someone, you were not to be treated under God's law differently if you were foreign born rather than natural born. You know, they couldn't like remove your toenails, you know, before they killed you. If you murdered someone just because you were foreign born. In other words, the penalty wasn't to be harsher just because you were foreign born. Nor was the penalty to be lighter. None of this nonsense of he was a minor or, you know, like, well, he was foreign born and their culture doesn't look at murder the same way we do. 
So we will just let him off with 20 years rather than life. Or we'll just whip him rather than execute him. Because his culture was different. The penalty couldn't be lighter. It was the same law. One law for both. Both the natural born and the foreign born. And we see this repeatedly. And I'll just share a few verses with you out of God's word. Leviticus 20, verse 1, turn there. The book of Leviticus, chapter 20, verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, verse 2, Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever of the children of Israel or the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Moloch, he shall surely be put to death, The people of the land shall stone him with stones. In God's economy, when you were there in the nation of Israel, whether you were foreign born or natural born, you were under the same law. You were treated the same under his law. There was equity in the law of God, unlike the laws of men. So often. Look at Leviticus 18, verses 20 through 26. Leviticus 18, verses 20 through 26, talking about some sexual crimes. It says, Moreover, you shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defile yourself with her. And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Moloch, nor shall you profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman, It is an abomination, nor shall you mate with any animal to defile yourself with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. It is perversion. Do not defile yourselves with any of these things, for by all these the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomit out its inhabitants." You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments and shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your nation, neither any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. It was the same law, one law for both foreign born and natural born. Look at Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16. Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 16. It says, and whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the stranger, as well as him who is born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. It was the same law for both the foreign born and the natural born. Same law for all. And this last verse here, 24.16 brings us to my third assertion that, yes, there was a process of immigration in Israel. There was a process of immigration in Israel. The open border folk think people should just be able to pass willy-nilly between nations. They quote the stranger verses to support their view. But these strangers in Israel weren't just allowed to embrace whatever they wanted. They had to assimilate to the Lord's law and customs. And the scriptures are repeatedly clear on that. Like our last verse from the second assertion points to, dealing with blasphemy, they could not just set up shop in Israel and start propagating another religion. Start promulgating the worship of other gods and adherence to them and their law and word. They were not allowed to blaspheme the Lord. If they wanted to worship other gods, they had to keep it privately hidden. That is not what is happening in America today and throughout the West with the influx of foreign-born. Israel was based on a covenant. You joined yourself to the covenant. You submitted to the Lord's law and rule. These weren't just a bunch of strangers in Israel doing their own thing. Enjoying the wonders of multiculturalism and polytheism under the guise of religious liberty, which I'll address shortly. Look at Numbers 15, verse 16. 
turn there. Numbers, verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 16. And look what it says here. It says, One law and one custom shall be for you and for the stranger who dwells among you. It was always God's intent to win all the peoples of the earth unto himself. In the Old Testament, he picked one racial people in one geographical location and tried to draw all the peoples of the earth to them. In the New Testament, that's been flipped on its head, and now we go to all the nations, of the, or we're supposed to go to all the nations of the earth, bringing them the great salvation of Jesus Christ and his rule. Understand? And we saw that even in the book of Acts, right? On the day of Pentecost, there was not only just Jews from Israel gathered there, but there were proselytes from all kinds of nations there when the apostles were able to preach the great salvation to them. There in Acts chapter 2, I believe it was. Look at Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29. We're just looking at a few verses here. This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. It's talking about sacrificing bulls and goats. It's talking about the religion of the Israelites. And the strangers were to participate in it. Just as it said in Numbers um, 15, 16, they to observe the laws and customs of the Lord. They weren't just there willy-nilly setting up shop, doing whatever they want to do with their God and their customs. Look at Leviticus 17, verses 8 and 9. Also you shall say to them, whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meeting to offer it to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from among his people. Again, same law, same custom, applying to everyone. Leviticus chapter 22, turn there. Verse 18. Leviticus chapter 22, verse 18. Speak to Aaron and his sons and to the children of Israel and say to them, Whenever, whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers in Israel who offers this sacrifice for any of his vows or for any of his freewill offerings which they offer to the Lord as burnt offerings. Again, it addresses both the natural born and the foreign born. They are all brought under the law and custom of the Lord there in Israel. That's important. They had to submit to the Lord's law and customs, his rule and religion. They had to assimilate. This was the process of immigration to Israel. And the magistrates of any nation have the right and the duty to have those who want to live in the nation assimilate to their law and custom. Let me repeat that to you. The magistrates of any nation have the right and the duty to have those who want to live in their nation assimilate to their law and custom. To do otherwise is A, asinine, and two, or B, dangerous. Now, I know that's some deep... heady intellectual stuff, asinine. You know, it's like last week when I pointed out why I don't care for, you know, rich people. They suck. (laughs) You know, it's like, you know, as you get older, you just don't care to, you know, lay it all out. You know what I mean? You get older, you just kind of have this nebulous thing up there. Rich people suck. You know, you think we should just have open borders, asinine. (laughs) You know, it's just that. It's how your mind starts working, okay? So, anyhow, let me try to talk a little bit more about this. Why do I say asinine? Why do I say dangerous? The open border people try to make a distinction between times of war 
and one people just want to immigrate who have no such ill intentions to make war. Borders or walls are okay, they concede, for times of war. But not just all the time with all these laws to get into another country. They don't want that. And I say, seriously? Anyone with one scintilla of sense and just a cursory reading of history understands that you can defeat another nation one of two ways. One, either attack and conquer them by force, or two, infiltrate them with your people to you subjugate their culture, economics, and religion to yours. As many nations have fallen by the latter as the former. If you want to live in a nation where Islam is prevalent and where Sharia is the law that rules, then stay in such a nation or go to it. But don't make us accept your religion and law. Now, I know we live in this era of religious liberty, which is really nothing more than religious licentiousness, and which believes the lie that there is neutrality amongst worldviews and religions, and that religion should just be regulated over to the sideline of life, merely personal, surely nothing within the public realm. But this will fail. It always does in the end. The only thing holding that all together right now is the pursuit of wealth. That's a little thin veneer of civilization that keeps Americans putting up with each other. They all have the same desire. Get rich. Wealth, money, materialism, and greed. And when it's gone... You'll see how this all folds in on itself like a house of cards. When all religions are viewed as equal, that is when you know you live in a statist hell. This is why President Trump, just this last week, like Obama, like Bush and Clinton before him, honored Islam, respected and redefined Islam. Edward Gibbons, who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, said that before Rome fell, quote, the politicians found all religions equally useful. That's the status hell you live in, called America, brothers and sisters. By the way, here's the whole quote from Gibbons. He said, the various modes of worship which prevailed in the Roman world were all considered by the people as equally true, by the philosopher as equally false, and by the politicians as equally useful. And thus, listen to what he says now, and thus toleration produced not only mutual indulgence, but even religious concord. That is America. (laughs) What he just described there. That's what we live in. What Gibbons described is what we have today in America. Everyone is willing to get along so they can continue their common pursuit of wealth and ease and all can remain drunk on their materialistic fatness. And it will all end when the materialism fails. Religious liberty? Yeah. You'll see where it ends up. Why? Because you can read history and see where it always ends up. Multiculturalism under statism, we'll see where that ends up because we know where it always ends up. It always fails. Always. And America will be no different. America is no longer a light on the hill, as our founders envisioned. We are now a statist hell. When you read Christopher Columbus, when you read the Mayflower Compact, everything was done to glorify God and propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every colony in early America required you to be a Christian in order to be a magistrate. That's all gone. We are now a statist hell where the state thinks it is God. Listen to me now. Multiculturalism cannot work under statism. Just read history. 
Only Christianity has accomplished it in the past, where you can bring people together of different cultures and nations, and they can actually exist to some extent with each other. Only Christianity has brought the many nations of the earth together. How and why? Because of Jesus. Because Christ is the one who brings all tribes, nations, and tongues together under his rule. Because they all hold him and his rule in common. This is true multiculturalism, where you maintain your distinctives as a culture, as a people, yet you have a common bond, and it's found in Christ. That doesn't work under statist rule. Multiculturalism through statism cannot work, and that is what we have in America now. Whenever past civilizations have tried to bring all the peoples together under the state, it has always failed. Read about the Babylonians, read about the Romans, on through history. It always fails in the end. The all-powerful state brings people together in order to weaken them as a people, to retard and remove their distinctives so that they are easily managed by the state. And our federal government, which is at war with Christ, has been doing this for decades now, bringing in people hostile to our Christian way of life, institutions, and law in order to strengthen the hand of the state, your tax dollars at work. Billions have gone into this program. They have softened up the American people to embrace this with over a hundred years of secular enlightenment thought. Foreigners have way more available to them than native-born Americans do regarding privileges. And I could do an exciting hour-long lecture on that matter alone. Live without a social security number and you'll learn the differences quickly. How the foreigner is in a much better standing than the citizen in the eyes of this government. The magistrates we have in our day are Christ haters. Why would you try and impose something like open borders on the people to bring so-called Christian change? I find that bizarre. Unlike the magistrates of old in the West who wanted people pointed to Christ and his rule, these men who rule in America today want to destroy the West with their utopian, let's deny the nature of man, one world citizen schemes. And I tire of the guilt manipulation by some Christians. And it comes in two forms. One is they proffer Matthew chapter 25, verse 43. The stranger came and you did not invite him in. You keep him out with your borders and immigration processes. And two, we should evangelize the stranger, the foreigner. Christ has brought them here for us to do so. These two arguments are used more than any other, and I say used by most as a manipulative tool, to get Christians to embrace no borders, open borders, No immigration process ideology. So let's turn to Matthew 25, verse 43. Matthew chapter 25, verse 43. Christ is speaking. And it says, I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. So I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Because of your borders, because of your immigration process. Matthew 25, 43 is addressing someone who is a stranger to you. Okay? A stranger to you. Not necessarily a foreigner. There's plenty of people who are a stranger to you in your own country. Most people, their own neighbor is a stranger to them. That's how little interaction people seem to have with each other nowadays. Not necessarily a foreigner, though a foreigner would not be precluded from this admonition from the Lord. The Old Testament, for example, in Exodus 22.21, mark that down, Exodus 22.21 and other verses make it clear we are not to mistreat the foreigner. 
Jesus is upholding, as he often did, the teaching of Old Testament Scripture. We are not to mistreat the foreigner in our midst. But this does not mean we bring all the strangers of the world to where we live. Christ never anywhere taught such an idea or obligation. In fact, he taught precisely the opposite. He said, we're to go to them. Remember, the Old Testament paradigm has been flipped on its head by Christ. We go to them. If they embrace the message, their lives change. Their communities change. Their nations change. By us going to them. We go to them. We send missionaries. If they reject Christ's rule, then they will continue to feel the consequences of their rebellion against God. But nowhere does it say that we're to bring them all into our geographical nation in order to evangelize them, give them free stuff, and hope they convert. We should want to see their nation conquered for Christ. We go to them. We should want to see their nation conquered for Christ, not bring them all to our nation and hope they are one to Christ. We should not want people pouring into America just so we can show them hospitality, give them free stuff, and evangelize them. It's like the dopey, Christ taught us to go out, right? And yet most of American Christianity still follows the Old Testament paradigm. They put on little programs inside their church buildings and invite everybody in. Now they got this whole idea that this is how it should work, you know, regarding our nation. And we just sit here and we invite them all in and we act spiritual about it. We're here, we're, we, we're for that because we can evangelize them. Yeah. Where are all these Christians who are evangelizing these people? That's what I'd like to know. Because anyone involved in it will be first to tell you they're far and few between. When the pagan Danes came pouring into Saxony, destroying their culture and denigrating everything Christian, Alfred the Great wanted them to embrace Christ and assimilate to Christ's rule. And this was the thinking and motivation for many Christian men throughout the West for centuries. Because of Alfred the Great, many of the conquered Danes became Christian and submitted to Christ's rule. And many other oppressed peoples of the earth looked to Alfred as they have to other Christian leaders throughout history for aid and succor to stand against those oppressing them in their countries. Not just open up the borders and let everybody pile in when they believe in pagan thought so that they can infiltrate and then eventually overturn your economy, your religion, your culture to theirs. But America today isn't about any of that. What Alfred and Christian men of the West were in the past. And the paradigm for us is to go to them, conquer their nation for Christ. Now let me throw in a personal note, because there will be those who will be like, oh yeah, Chuella guy. Yeah, how unspiritual. He doesn't evangelize the Muslims. He doesn't evangelize anybody. Yeah, he's just one of those scared white people who wants to, you know, use scripture to teach white supremacy. You know, yeah. Okay, can you tell I spent enough time out at the universities? Yeah. The truth of the matter is, I do evangelize. We're in the midst of the situation that we're in, and going to the universities is awesome. You can meet people from all over the world there going to school. Some of the universities we go to minister at, there's more foreign-born students than there are native-born students at the university. I'm not talking about some little university of 600 students. I'm talking about tens of thousands of student universities. More foreign. So we seize the opportunity to bring Christ to them right there on our land. Because that's what we're in the midst of as Christian people. So, yeah, I evangelize, but I'm not going to say that's the way to do this. 
is what the statists are doing, what our federal government's doing, because I've read enough history to know what their aim is. It's to weaken the people with so many different religions, beliefs, and cultures so they can more easily control them. That's how the statist thinks. He always wants cultures and religions against each other so that they can be above it all and be the ones who kind of referee it all with their status hell and their laws which never seem to end, which there's laws within the immigration process in this country that are crazy. There's other parts of it that are good that this federal government totally ignores. It's bizarre. Crazy stuff. So yes, I do evangelize. And yes, I evangelize the Muslims. We put out hundreds of these little DVDs talking about the, talking about the life of Christ. I'd have invited I don't know how many Muslim people to my home for dinner after I've talked to them about Jesus. Or because they wouldn't come after I talked to them about Jesus. I don't even talk about Jesus. I just act nice to them and shoot the breeze. You know, you go into the same businesses you, you, where people have it, and there's the Muslim guy. So I've tried it both ways. Talking about Jesus, not talking about Jesus, to being nice. Invite him to my house for dinner, not one has ever taken me up on it. I don't know if it's some cultural thing or what. Somebody may inform me of that, but... I know if I was in somebody else's country and they invited me to their house for dinner, I'd view it as a great honor. I'd go and have dinner with them. Why don't they want to have dinner with us? They are not assimilating to anything in America. They're building their mosques as quickly as they can. They're actually out evangelizing. If you don't go to the universities, you don't know that. If you go to the universities, they are evangelizing on the universities. Across this country. They know exactly what they want to accomplish. Anybody who thinks Islam isn't a dangerous religion, you're just an ignorant boob who's never read any history. Why don't you go and interview some people who've lived amongst them, who aren't Muslims, and they'll tell you what it's like to live where they predominate. Why don't you look at their culture? It isn't the wonderful thing that the college professors in this country have made it out to be and the media in this country have made it out to be. It's awful. The religion you embrace has implications on how you govern your life, how your nation is governed. The new religion of America is believe in yourself. What if you're an imbecile? Believe in yourself. Whenever man rejects God, the God of the Bible, he always has to replace it with something else. All these leftists who hate Christianity, carrying water for Islam now. You always replace it with something else. If you just want to be your arrogant, average, pompous-ass American, I believe in myself. Yeah. You reject the God of the Bible, you gotta replace it with something. You gotta replace it with yourself. How dumb is that? Anybody wants to replace God with himself? I believe in myself. I believe in you. You know? And you gotta be totally, you're just dense in the head. You never gotten a good view of yourself or of mankind? In closing, let me say, All the verses proffered by those who say no borders or open borders or no immigration process that I have read or listened to so far are bogus hermeneutically. I found every one of their verses to be acts of eisegesis where they're reading into the passage something that is not there at all in order to bring you to the conclusion of their view that there should be no borders or there should be open borders or there should be no immigration process. Finally, let me close with this. Nations should exist and always will exist, even if you don't want them to. Okay? Thank you for laughing, hon, because that's how I am. 
I, I, I meet these people all the time. Well, I shouldn't exist, you know. I, you know, government shouldn't be involved in marriage. Get out of the business of marriage. Okay, well, you can live in your Pollyanna fantasy land till the day you die. Human nature is what you're forgetting. Man's wicked. And it's never going to be here on earth, that little fuzzy world. Imagine all the people. You know? John Lennon, who's dead because some guy put a bullet in his head. Yeah, that guy. Imagine all the people. Seriously? So, to burst your bubble, okay, finally I may say, nations should exist and always will exist even if you don't want them to. Number two, borders have always existed and will always exist even if you don't want them to. And third, immigration processes in some form have always existed and will always exist even if you don't want them to. So please, don't make up stories that the Christian view is nations should not exist, borders should not exist, borders should be open, and immigration processes are unbiblical because you're wrong. Let's stand up and close in a word of prayer. Amen. Hallelujah, Father. Lord, we give thanks and we give praise to you for this time that we had in your word this day, and I ask and pray that you would use it for good. And Lord, you know there's so much more that can be addressed regarding this matter. I just pray that this gives some foundational standing for people to think about. Because Lord, that is the most important, our presupposition. And so I tried to start there. Lord, the details, yeah, they always get worse as people don't have a biblical presupposition. And Lord, I just ask and pray that you would be glorified through what was preached here today, that you would use it for good in the hearts and minds of those gathered here and those who will listen later. And Lord, we do ask and pray that you would continue to build your kingdom in our lives, your thinking in our hearts and minds, that we might be faithful to you in the earth and do right by you in the earth and declare your ways and thoughts to all the peoples of the earth. And I ask these things in Christ Jesus' holy name. We thank you that you have redeemed us. And may we tell others about you too. And I ask and pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated. And we're going to take communion at this time. You can feel free to take communion with us as long as you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, do not take communion as the Lord's table is only for believers to observe. And we do observe the Lord's table every week at Mercy Seat. And we do that first and foremost because we need to remember this great salvation. We have to remember what Jesus did when he died on the cross. Because by him doing what he did, we have salvation if we believe in him. We should have been put to death for our sins. But Christ died in our stead so that if we believe in him, God will forgive us of our sins and give us right standing with him. And that's the sole means whereby we can approach God is through Christ. That's why we call what Jesus did when he died on the cross the finished work of Christ. You cannot add to it. Your salvation is found in Christ alone. And this time at his table reminds us of that important fact because when you're at his table, you see there's only two elements there, the fruit of the vine representing his shed blood and the bread representing his body. You'll notice there's nothing else here, showing that our communion is through Christ alone. It's not Jesus plus a list of all my good works. It's not Jesus plus a list of all my holy living. It's Jesus plus nothing that gives me right standing with the Father. The good works that I do, the holy living that I demonstrate, those things are the result of my saving faith in Christ. They're the fruit or the evidence of my saving faith in Christ. Listen to me now. In other words, I don't do those things to try and obtain God's acceptance. Rather, I do them because I have obtained his acceptance. And there's a huge difference between those two. 
John Calvin wrote a whole entire treatise on it during the Reformation. Massively important. The Apostle Paul wrote at the Lord's table. So important, it was observed every week by the early church. And he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen? You proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. This is a great salvation. Whether you've been a Christian for five seconds or 55 years, always your sole approach to him is through Jesus. And this time at his table reminds us of that. Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks and praise to you for your goodness to us. May we be your faithful ambassadors in this earth, declaring your holy law, your word, and this great salvation to others. May we not hide it under a bushel and keep it to ourselves, but may we look for, may we seize upon opportunities to point others to you, to talk about you and your ways to our fellow man. Lord, I pray that we would be bold witnesses of yours in the earth. That you would empower us by your Holy Spirit to be your witnesses. Lord, may each one here purify themselves of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, walk faithful to you. And may we make you known to others both by word and deed. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together.